So, as mentioned, I wanted to have a little closer look today at mindfulness and uh, the meaning and some various aspects and qualities of mindfulness. Um, because this is sort of next up, really, in the gradual training, um, which we've been looking at together. I might not have always made it very clear that um, that's what we were doing. But um, last week we looked at um, cultivating wholesome emotions or developing um, emotions that are very helpful on the path, qualities of the heart, which can be a great support for us. And um, we did this at the level of the way we use our senses in, in the world. So, first of all, the actions of body and speech as an aspect of sila, of virtue, but also the way we use our mind. And in um, the gradual training, this is called um, Indriya Samvara Sila, which literally means a kind of sense restraint. But it's, for me, a lot more helpful to think of it as guarding the senses, so that when we come in contact with impressions at the eye sense door, or the sounds, or tastes, physical touches, smells, etc., and also thoughts in the mind, we guard our mind against developing negativity and um, responding in ways which are not very helpful for ourselves, even if they don't manifest in verbal unskillful actions or physically unskillful actions. Um, it's about learning to use our perception skillfully so that we're not creating more suffering for ourselves. So starting to look, for example, at a person from a different angle, rather than always focusing on their faults or the things that trigger you about somebody. Learning to actually see perhaps that person's pain if they're really, you know, persistently involved in unskillful behaviour. Or just see another side of them, you know, maybe some of their good qualities, which we tend to uh, ignore sometimes if there's something that particularly stands out as irksome. And also having a bit more understanding for each other, giving each other the benefit of the doubt. You know, one of the things one of my first teachers um, said to me was to never ascribe intentions to another person. <clears throat> and I found that really helpful because often we create a lot of suffering by sort of creating a story around what somebody said or even the way they looked at us <laughs> or the fact they didn't say something we wanted them to say. And we go into a whole story about that and create so much suffering when we really don't know where they're at. You know, they may not have been thinking about us at all. That's most probable. So we talked about that and also about some of the cultivation of those wholesome emotions. And this was all because it provides a very good foundation for the later steps on the path as well. So that by the time we get into the practice of mindfulness, we've already overcome a lot of the really coarse hindrances to meditation. Yeah. So I've probably mentioned several times in talks to this group and other groups that the five hindrances that are very um, skillfully put together by the Buddha in a, in a certain order, um, are kind of public enemy number one in meditation. It's almost as though <coughs> um, the stronger the hindrances, the weaker the enlightenment factors, and conversely, the more we can develop these enlightenment factors, the weaker the hindrances become. Yeah, so as we develop strong mindfulness, it helps us to overcome the hindrances. But at the same time, hindrances of, you know, for example, sense desire and aversion, um, restlessness, doubt, and um, what's the other one? Sleepiness, weariness, drowsiness. These also weaken the mindfulness. So that it's like where to start with this? So we can start through basically purifying our conduct of body, speech and mind in the ways that we've discussed already. And then by the time we get on to the sati, the... Um, development of mindfulness in the gradual training, we've already got a certain amount of happiness and um, stability of mind from, from um, our own good conduct in daily life. Yeah, We already have a sense of feeling that we're on the right path, we're basically good people, You know, we're doing our best, we're being kind to each other. And the Buddha said that two kinds of happiness are already arising through that practice. Um, the happiness of blamelessness, and of Ajasukha, and unblemished happiness, Avya Sekra Sukha. And these are direct consequences of living a virtuous life. So moving into the awareness or the sati, 
Um, in the texts, the Buddha talks about basic functions, purposes for developing mindfulness. And the first one, he says, it's in the Anguttara 9, 63, is to prevent us from breaking the precepts. In other words, to keep us on track with you know, beautiful, virtuous conduct which brings happiness to ourselves and others and protects our own mind too. The next one is to overcome doubt about the training, about the practice. So that's another of those hindrances. And then it's interesting, he says, ill will towards our companions on the spiritual path. So mindfulness helps us to overcome that. Again, one of the hindrances, but also because the harmony in community is so important to the practice. And then he says it also helps us, of course, restrain and eventually abandon the hindrances. And later to see into the wisdom, well, to develop the wisdom that discerns the arising and passing away of phenomena. So this is now moving into what we may call insight practice and eventually to abandon all the fetters. So those fetters are the things that prevent us from seeing the highest happiness of Nibbana. So greed, hatred and delusion basically at the root of all those fetters. And of course the delusion of self is, is one of the most important sort of um, deeply ingrained um, delusions that creates an awful lot of suffering for us when we over-identify with things that happen which are actually just conditioned, you know, and our whole being is just a process of conditioning. So by seeing that it helps to bring a lot more compassion into things and a lot of letting go can happen from the, as a result of loosening this wrong view of self. So what is this mindfulness. One of the best definitions I've um, read of mindfulness comes from Bhikkhu Bodhi and he says that um, sati is that aspect of awareness which brings the content of the present moment into focus. So it makes it very clear so that wisdom has a chance to arise. And it's also that aspect of awareness that can sustain itself on phenomena for long enough for that wisdom to arise. Because if we only see things fairly superficially and we keep on jumping from one object to the next, that mindfulness never has a chance to grow strong enough to be able to really penetrate into the truth of things at a deeper level than what we've been able to see before. Yeah? And this particular kind of awareness that the Buddha talks about, I'm saying awareness now, but I prefer the word sati to keep it in its Pali, it um, also carries an aspect of ethical care, along with it, yeah? And if you look at the Eightfold Path, um, it is a kind of sequential path that we start out with some understanding of right view into the fact that we all suffer and that suffering has a cause and also there's an end to suffering. And so this can start to help us develop compassion, right? When we see the universal nature of suffering. And so that feeds in directly to right intention, which are intentions of kindness, of gentleness, of letting go, making peace, yeah, giving rather than trying to acquire. So there are natural consequences of understanding a little bit about suffering. And as a result of those right intentions, our bodily and verbal behaviour starts to improve. We become much more careful about not causing harm to other beings, right? And if our behaviour is motivated by loving kindness, by non-cruelty, by peace, giving up, giving away, then we're much less likely to cause harm, at least not intentional harm. Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible not to create any harm. And, you know, we always, I still say unskillful things from time to time, or I'm a bit impatient with somebody. And, you know, there was no intention to hurt them, but it's just as we're trying to refine our behaviour, this is bound to happen. But at least when we're focusing on our intentions and purifying it at that level, the um, likelihood of really causing harm to another decreases significantly. Yeah? And so that leads into the sila, which then leads into things like right um, effort, or in other words, the cultivation of wholesome states and overcoming unwholesome states, restraining unwholesome states of mind. And so this kind of right effort circles around mindfulness at this point. You need a certain amount of mindfulness to see how to develop the wholesome states, how to overcome the unwholesome states. And as you overcome those unwholesome qualities of mind or reactions, reactivities, 
um, even resentment sometimes, and start to develop the beautiful qualities, then that mindfulness starts to strengthen and become a tool that you can really use in your practice. One example of um, mindfulness just carrying this aspect of care um, came to me through reading a little notice that they put up by the taps in Gaia House. It was down in the yogi kitchen when I was on self retreat. And it said something like, um, please be mindful of running water in the, in the night. And I read that and I thought, oh, that's a really um, interesting uh, translation or an interesting context in which to use the word mindfulness. Because please be mindful of running water in the night doesn't mean be aware that you're running water. It's more about being careful not to run water at a time that it may disturb others, right? So they're using mindfulness in a way that has um, that points towards being caring about the consequences of one's actions, right? So you be mindful about not about running water in the night really means you know, have a bit of sensitivity that the yogis want to sleep, maybe they're getting very sensitive to noise, and you might wake them up if you run water at the wrong time. So that's just an, a way that mindfulness, the word mindfulness, is used um, and implies this sense of care within it. Another really interesting um, addition, I guess, or aspect of mindfulness that I use a lot is to add kindness to the way that I'm aware. So this is looking more at the how I'm aware than the what I'm aware of. Yeah? My teacher, Ajahn Brahm, says that mindfulness can be likened to the light of the sun, and you can think of kindness as the warmth of the sun. And when these two flow together, they help this plant, I imagine it like a little fern in the forest, like a little filled up fern, curled up fern, just sort of slowly unfurling with the light and the warmth of the sun. Yeah, so mindfulness helps us see things that we haven't seen before, but the kindness gives them that sense of, gives that sense of ease and safety and friendliness so that things can really feel at ease in your presence, right? Because so often we have maybe thoughts and emotions that arise and we treat them like unwanted guests. We treat them like sort of enemies and things to avoid. Whereas actually these things are trying to tell us something. Often they're things that are unresolved from our past and they just need a little bit of care and attention. Yeah. And so when we meet them with kindness, it helps us to undermine those hindrances again of ill will or negativity, which can be very subtle in the meditation practice. I know for myself, for years, practicing with um, Goenkaji, and really incredibly grateful to him for my foundation in the practice, which gave me the aspiration to go forth. It was so life-changing for me. But later on in my practice, I realised that his instruction to be equanimous to everything that arose was sometimes not as powerful as actually adding that bit of kindness. You know, there was this sense that I can be kind of okay with this, but maybe I'm still kind of keeping my distance a little bit, or I'm just trying not to react. And that could keep the mind just a little bit guarded, or maybe I was having, you know, there were certain tendencies of mine that would still come into that awareness unconsciously, because that's just how I'm conditioned. And when I met Ajahn Brand's teachings, and he really emphasised adding kindness to the way that one is aware, it made such a huge difference for me. It really softened that relationship with what's there. And in a way, brought the mindfulness closer to its object. So that it wasn't this sort of um, slightly standoffish equanimity. It was actually a deep intimacy with whatever was arising. And I find it quite wonderful that kindness can be employed within the mindfulness to actually overcome some of those hindrances that crop up in meditation. So we can use this kindness throughout the path, which is wonderful, of course, and um, hopefully also um, influences our behaviour in everyday life, because we're inclining that direction. So the other aspect of mindfulness, which is really important to differentiate it from ordinary everyday awareness, is this notion of mindfulness being like bare awareness or bare attention. Yeah. So what does it mean to be bare? 
And basically, bare awareness means that the mindfulness is free from, again, what Bhikkhu Bodhi calls cognitive clutter. So in a way, that's what comes up between you and the object. It's, it's beyond the felt um, contact. Mindfulness is bare awareness would be just aware of the contact of experience. For example, there's a sight and you're just aware that you're seeing you know, maybe you're aware that it's beautiful, but your mind doesn't start proliferating into all kinds of stories around it or past memories about it or projections into the future. Yeah. There was this really nice story I heard recently from, um, it was Sharon Salzberg. She was telling the story that Joseph once, um, Joseph Goldstein, um, most of you must know them, Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Joseph Goldstein um, started uh, the International Meditation Society in uh, Barry, Massachusetts, I think in the 70s. So they were like some of the first insight practitioners to come over to the West and bring some of these teachings, mainly from Burma. And um, I think both of them started with Goenkaji, actually, like I did. And uh, in the early days, a student came to Joseph Goldstein and said, oh, he was practicing his meditation and he felt all this tension in his jaw. You know, because often when we start to meditate and our mindfulness increases, we start to see all the different places where we're holding these tensions. And, um, you know, we have tightness or maybe some trauma lodged in the body somewhere. So he came to Joseph and said, you know, it was really shocking to me to see all this tension and I just realised what an uptight person I am. And Joseph said, oh... Okay, so you mean you felt some tension in your jaw? And the guy said, yeah, that's right. I felt some tension in my jaw and realised that I've always been a really uptight person, like all my life. And because of this, all my relationships have failed, you know. And Joseph looked at him again and said, right, so you mean that you're feeling and experiencing some tension in your jaw? (laughs) So he's trying to keep on bringing him back to just that felt sense right of what's happening and away from the you know the um what we call papancha and um constructs around these things and the guy again said yes that's right i felt some tension in my jaw and i realized that all my relationships have been ruined because of that and i'm going to be lonely for the rest of my life and at that point joseph said do you realize how much suffering you're causing for yourself by adding this on to the felt experience You know, you already had to struggle with this tension in your jaw, which is hurting. But then, you know, the rest of it is just adding suffering. And that's what the Buddha called the second arrow. Yeah, so you have what he calls dukkha, just the bare sort of unsatisfactoriness, discomfort, irritation of life, of feeling, of sense impression. And then you have this second arrow, which is our response, our reaction to that. And especially the stories we create around it. Yeah, I used to sit for very long hours in Burma and sit through sometimes quite a lot of pain, but not with force, more out of interest to really examine what was going on. And I think it's only advisable to do that when you have quite a lot of um, strong mindfulness established, along with equanimity and along with this sort of sense of investigation. But still, I would from time to time see the um, concerns starting to come if my leg would be going numb, for example, and I'd think, oh, yeah, my leg's going numb. What if it actually dies? Could it actually die? Maybe I'm cutting off the blood circulation. Gosh, what if I get up and, like, my leg is destroyed and I become paralysed? <laughs> and then I'd realise, of course, gosh, you know, you're only sitting for, like, a couple of hours. It's just a sensation in the leg and no, no damage is going to ensue from that. But at the time, it's this idea that my leg, you know, is the sense of self that comes in there that creates what is not a particularly unpleasant sensation into something quite unbearable and really quite frightening, you know. And it's often when this sense of self gets mixed up in the experience that we're having at the sense level that the suffering is exacerbated a lot. (laughs) So in the one sense, this their awareness is cluttered up by our thoughts, by our concepts, but it's also cluttered up by the sense of a me in here experiencing this, somebody experiencing it. My knee hurts, my knee's in agony, compared to, oh, there's pulsing, oh, there's heat, there's throbbing, 
there's tension. That's a completely different experience. And I have to make a disclaimer while giving these examples because I'm in no way suggesting people should just sit through pain or force themselves to sit with really, you know, a lot of discomfort. I actually think that can be quite counterproductive and even, I mean, there are people, there's a monk, I think he's an English monk, who apparently sat through so much pain that he had to have a double knee replacement. (laughs) So we're not encouraging that. And I think that's usually quite unlikely to happen. That was a kind of gong-ho attitude. So it's always about being kind and being gentle and first checking whether there's something that you're adding to the pain and just stay with it that little bit longer, you know, see if you can open up to it, see if you can handle it with more gentleness, with more kindness and a sense of curiosity, yeah, investigative curiosity. And then you may just find something loosens and relaxes and the pain sometimes can vanish just in an instant. You know, when we stop clinging, when we stop holding on. So it's an experiment and then there's no hard and fast rule. But the idea is to get closer and closer to just that felt sense of what's happening. The Buddha has, um, I think it's Bahia, he talks to a monk called Bahia and he gives him this one instruction which has become fairly famous among Buddhist circles and he says, in the scene, just the scene. In the herd, just the herd. In the felt, just the felt. In the sensed, just the sensed. Yeah, he covers all six senses anyway, in one order or another. And, um, and this sounds kind of a little bit uh, like a Zen koan or something. But the idea there is that we get to the stage where we're just feeling feelings. There's not a me feeling the feeling. It's just feeling is being felt. Hmm? Sounds are being heard. So this sense of self starts to weaken as we become closer and closer towards this bare awareness that's just aware of what's arising in the present and has a chance to see more deeply into it because of that. So, yeah, the other aspect, last aspect I wanted to touch into, I mentioned at the beginning of the session, which was mindfulness and its protective function. Yeah, That mindfulness, again, is not just bare. It's not just that we should let in absolutely anything to our awareness with no discrimination at all. Mindfulness actually has a function to keep out unwholesome states and to help us to increase the wholesome states. Yeah. So this again is an aspect of right effort to see that we're developing and increasing the things which lead to decrease of suffering and that we're actually restraining the unhelpful Um, tendencies of mind yeah I don't want to say bad and good because that sounds like a moral judgment but it's basically anything that turns away from suffering and that leads us towards greater peace greater clarity of mind Mm? more compassion more kindness these wholesome qualities of mind so the example which I can't resist sharing that um, again comes from Ajahn Brown I think he's making a little bit of a dig actually at one of the traditions but in a very um (laughs) a very sort of innocent way but he says it's like um, that he gives this story of a rich lady who goes away for a while and um, she has uh, a watchman this is in ancient India and she asks this watchman to be very mindful of the house while she's away so she says to them please be mindful you know and make sure the burglars don't come and this uh, watchman says yes yes madam I'll be very mindful so she goes away on holiday and he, um, he's mindful of the house, making sure that he knows exactly what's going on. And one day this burglar does come. But he stays in his tower, in his little watch station or whatever. And uh, he says, oh, burglar coming, burglar coming. And the burglar goes into the house. And the burglar starts going around and having a look for all the stuff and starts actually taking some of the stuff and taking it out. And this watchman thinks, oh, the burglar's now taking something out. Okay, I know what's happening. I have to report back to my, you know, to the lady when she comes back. And then she starts taking the safe out. (laughs) And this watchman's very aware of what's happening, you know, but he's kind of only aware of what's happening and not the purpose of why he's supposed to be aware so when, he come, when this lady comes back from a holiday, she's pretty shocked and she goes into the house and she sees everything kind of destroyed and upside down 
And she says to the watchman, what happened? I asked you to be mindful. And of course, you know what he answers. But madam, I was mindful. When I saw the burglar coming, I saw burglar coming in, burglar coming in. When the burglar was going out, I noted carefully, burglar going out, burglar going out. <laughs> and then I noted carefully, safe going out, safe going out. I was very mindful all the time. <laughs> And of course, she's not very pleased with that because he was missing the one important thing, which was why he needs to be aware and of what he needs to be aware. So in other words, the protective function of mindfulness to make sure that the right things are coming into your mind and uh, you're not getting rid of all the good things from your mind and allowing the burglars into your mind to rob you of peace and to rob you of your happiness. Hmm? <laughs> So mindfulness has a particular function and when we get to the point of uh, developing it more deeply in meditation, um, we actually learn to direct that mindfulness to what the Buddha calls the four satipatthanas, which can be seen as the four foundations. I prefer the four focuses of mindfulness because we've already developed a degree of mindfulness by the time we practice the satipatthana. We already have basic satisampajanya that's aware of what's happening. It's aware of the purpose of mindfulness. It's, it has this protective function intact. It carries this aspect of kindness along with it. And we're basically functioning well in life. Yeah. So in the suttas, like I'll just read a little passage from this one, which is um, the standard description of sati sampajanya. So this is basic mindfulness that we establish before going on to the satipatthanas. So the Buddha says, Come, bhikkhu, this is to a monk, be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. Act in full awareness when going forward and returning, when looking ahead and looking away, when flexing and extending your limbs, when wearing your robes and carrying your outer robe and bowl, or getting dressed and making sure you look, you know, have all your clothes stay on if you're a lay person. When eating, drinking and consuming food, when tasting, when defecating and urinating, when walking, san standing, sitting, when falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. Okay, So we're not only aware that we're doing these things, we're also aware, it says, with full awareness, right? And full awareness is the word sampajanya, which actually means... Um, sort of knowing with wisdom. And in the commentaries, there's different ways to know. And one of those is to know the purpose of what you're doing, yeah? So it's not only that you go ahead and you return, you know why you're going out, for example, to the shops or to the doctors, even though it's, um, you know, we're in lockdown at the moment, you know why you're going there. And you know how far you should stay behind the other person in the queue, for example, and why. And you make sure you maintain your distance. You know, if you're eating and drinking and consuming food, you're not only aware of the fact that you're doing that, but why you're doing that, you know, to nourish the body, to make it healthy so that you can practice, so that you can deepen in the path. Or you're eating the food that's appropriate to your particular medical condition, yeah? I also think it's important with the keeping silent and talking, you know, we know why we're talking, but also the content of what we're saying, whether it's sensitive, appropriate, timely, etc. And also with keeping silent, know the proper time to be silent and not to speak, to give somebody else space. In the Buddhist text, you have to be careful with silence. In the Buddhist text, the Buddha always used to consent by silence, by keeping silent. <laughs> And I had an email the other day that um, invited me to an online conference call. And the person who sent the email said, oh, if you're si you didn't reply to me, so am I to take your silence as consent? <laughs> because the venerable ones of old, you know, used to consent by silence. And so I said, no, 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 it doesn't mean that in this case. It's just because I haven't got around to replying. So um, we have to be aware <laughs> of what silence means. The other thing with silence, of course, in retreats is that sometimes it can become slightly passive-aggressive. You know, sometimes people are like, OK, I'm being silent, that means don't talk to me, don't look at me, don't ask me to pass the salt, or, you know, simple things. So it's always about keeping that kindness and that awareness of the purpose of these things, why we're doing these things, 
and um, how to do them at the right time. How fast to walk, you know, in walking meditation compared to when you're crossing the road, for example. So these things are really important and um, it's only at this point when somebody's well established in Satisampajanya that the Buddha then says one goes to a secluded resting place and then sits down, folds their legs, sets their body erect, that's how we sit with our straight back, fairly alert, and then establishes mindfulness in front of them. So this is where we already have some mindfulness that we can establish in front of us in the beginning of our practice. And from there, in, normally in the text, it either goes into breath meditation or into these four satipatthanas. So mindfulness has an object. It is directed at us in a certain domain. And, you know, in the satipatthanas, those domains are basically the body and the mind. So we direct this mindfulness towards the body, towards feelings that arise based on the body, towards the mind and the mind states, and then towards the mental content, the Dharma Anupasana. And the mental contents, I think, in the earliest versions of the suttas were basically the five hindrances and the seven enlightenment factors. So again, you know, as those hindrances weaken, those enlightenment factors increase. And so our contemplation can become increasingly um, directed towards developing those enlightenment factors. Yeah, so that's quite a lot. And I'm sure there's a lot more I could say as well, but I just wanted to um, highlight those particular elements of mindfulness that may not always be taught and um, hopefully rouse your curiosity further and perhaps uh, have a place from where to launch off into the Satipatthana in a, a later meeting if that's of interest to anybody or also into breath meditation, we could go on to that as well. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to open for some questions, comments or complaints and or otherwise general feedback, anything you'd like to share. So, um, I think I can see most of you, not all of you have your videos on, um, but, aha, great. If you do have your video on, it'd be helpful if you want to ask a question to just raise your hand physically. Um, if you don't have a video and you can use the icons at the bottom, there's one with called reactions and that has some kind of hand that sticks up so that I can see you want to speak. Otherwise, if you're on the phone, I'm not sure you have access to that, there is a chat box and you can type a comment in there if you wish. But I really encourage people to speak because I just really like to hear people's voices rather than my own the whole time. Because it's still a bit strange talking to a computer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, please feel free. Okay, Aura. Get to... I just Hi. want to say... Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to say that I find it uh, very loaded. So my mind is a bit congested with so much information. Mm -hmm. It'll take me time to digest it. Sure. And some, some of it 